As you work your way through an engineering career, you will meet people who are so good at their job, they will be able to tell you if a design will work or not just by looking at it. And then as you progress further, you will realize that these people are terrible engineers. Nowhere is this more true than aerodynamics. Aerodynamics is chaos. It is countless particles acting on complex features in counterintuitive ways. You will not know how an aerodynamic body will behave unless you have a good analysis of that body. And no analysis is good until it is backed up with testing. I have a good body. The race car, I mean, not whatever is going on here. I have done lots of analysis to see if this is not only fast, but also aerodynamically stable. But I haven't done any real testing. Thankfully, Bamboo just sent me their brand new H2D printer, so I can print a very large wind tunnel model. A few months ago, I told all of you to go out and buy a Bamboo 3D printer, and a lot of you did. Well, now you have to go buy another one. Bamboo Lab recently released its much-anticipated H2D. This is not a review video, there are plenty of those. If you're looking for one, I recommend Clow42, I'll link it in the description. Bamboo sent me this machine and asked me to use it to build a project, so I'm going to do that. And I'm going to talk about the machine and its features, while also talking about the challenges of making a scale wind tunnel model. And also, how to use the interstate as your wind tunnel. I've wanted to make a wind tunnel model for a while, and the bigger an aero model is, the more accurate it is. So when I found out the new printer is bigger, I thought, now is the time. The build volume of the new machine is over twice as big, so I chopped up my full-scale model into what I thought were reasonably sized chunks, and I scaled the whole thing down until those chunks fit in the print volume. That ended up being pretty near a quarter the size of the car, so I made it exactly 25%. There is one big thing I want to get out of this scale model, and that is to demonstrate aerodynamic stability. When you throw a dart, it wants to fly straight because of the heavy weight in the front and the fins on the back. The center of mass is up here, and the center of aerodynamic pressure is way back here. I want my car to fly straight as well, even though it has tires. If it isn't aerodynamically stable, it gets real squirrely real fast. Ask me how I know. Unfortunately, because of reasons, I can't put all the weight at the front and all the big flat surfaces at the rear. I need to fit stuff in here, like me. I did put a vertical stabilizer on the rear, complete with a ham sandwich, and I did try to put some heavy stuff at the front, like the battery. According to my measurements, the center of mass of the car with me in it is about here, and according to the computer analysis, the center of aerodynamic pressure is here. Very close. So here's the plan. I'm going to print a large model with a pivot right at the center of mass. Then I'm going to put that pivot on a sheet of plywood and stick it on the roof of my forerunner. When I drive around, if the car is stable, it will naturally want to point forward. If it's not, it will point some other, less good direction. The post is simple, I just welded a bar out of a flat plate, sharpened the tip to a point, and stuck on some bearings and 3D printed spacers. This post will slide into a hole on the print exactly where the center of mass is on the full-size car. I added three other holes to see what would happen when we move the center of mass forward or backward. Also, for fun, I designed three different vertical stabilizers to see how those affect stability. These parts are assembled with three bolts between each upper section, and then the lower sections just screw onto the bottom with flathead screws. I did forget to design a passageway for the wires on the first few parts, so we fixed that with a drill. I started to print these out of PET GHF. This is my go-to filament for most things, but I wanted something with more stiffness and better dimensional stability, so I went with ABS glass filled. This is one of my favorite filaments. It's pretty good all around. ABS alone likes to warp, but the glass fibers keep this really consistent. The big new feature of the H2D is the dual extruders. It can switch between two extruders fairly quickly instead of purging out old filament at every layer that has two materials. So it prints parts with two filaments way faster. I tested this out by printing the middle piece with polycarbonate for the windshield. The actual race car also has a polycarbonate windshield. This makes absolutely zero difference aerodynamically, but it does look a lot better with a windshield. The vertical stabilizer is PET GHF for no particular reason. This is held on with a long skinny screw that I had to lathe down to be even skinnier to fit in this tiny pocket. I also made these two other vertical stabilizers so we can see if size really does matter. One notable thing about the H2D that I haven't heard talked about too much is that it is noticeably quieter. I've had mine on my dining room table printing day and night, and it took me a few days to realize that it wasn't as distracting as the X1. The bamboo machines are all already quieter than most printers, but they did a really excellent job with the H2D in this respect, which is great if you share a house with someone or if you like printing while you sleep. The H2D has a couple optional non-3D printing features, a laser and a cutting module. Actually, you can use the cutting module with a marker too, so three extra features. I've had a few people ask me if it's worth it to get the laser, and here's my take. I already own a laser on my CNC router, and I rarely use it. But part of the reason I rarely use it is because it's a pain to set up and the software is terrible. 
The laser on the H2D is easy to set up. The software is intuitive with a good beginning tutorial. One of Bamboo's biggest strengths is the good user experience, and they kept that up with the laser. I can't think of too many things I want to do with the laser, but I thought the same thing about 3D printing before I bought my Bamboo X1, and I have over 3,000 hours on that machine in just over a year. I will probably not use the laser nearly as often as the printing capability, but I do like having it. If you're at the edge of your budget and you're not sure what you'd use it for, just get the regular printer. It is fantastic by itself. If, like me, you like having the capability, then go for it. You will want to figure out a way to ventilate air outside of your house. It gets smelly pretty easily with wood and leather. Also, you'll need to make sure that the inside of the printer stays clean. The laser does create particulates. It did come in handy for a couple of things on this project. I need a way to hold the model and that yaw torque sensor I have at the back at specific angles. I could do this with a straight edge and a sharpie, but with a laser I can not only etch out the specific locations of the sensor mount, but I can also pocket out those locations so it stays in place. Bamboo Lab is calling this an all-in-one personal manufacturing hub, and it does a lot. The laser and cutter are basically two extra machines built into one. I think when Bamboo asked me to make a project, they were thinking of something that used all of the features. And I did, and the functionality is well executed and easy to use. But ever since the rumors of this machine started, I was more interested in the expanded printing capabilities. And I'm very happy. This project would be worse on any other consumer printer. The larger volume allows for fewer parts. The heated chamber gives consistency and high strength. It's fast with support material and multiple filaments. It's a printer that allows me to do real engineering. Also, fake engineering. If you get the H2D, you can make your own scale super fast matte wind tunnel model. I uploaded the designs for this guy to Maker World. It prints in different pieces so you can screw it together and it actually rolls. With the laser, you can make a cool little stand that has a super fast signature. I did size this so you can print it on the Bamboo X1 or A1 if you angle it at 45 degrees so you don't have to have the new machine. If you're familiar with my car, you may be wondering why this one has a weird notch and cutout back here. Well, that's where the rocket engine goes. Insert legal mumbo jumbo about me not being responsible for you blowing off your fingers. It occurred to me as I was printing this thing that I wasn't actually measuring anything. It's good to know if the shape is stable, but how stable? A lot stable? Barely stable? The value I'm looking for here is the restoring moment. The moment about the center of mass that wants to spin the car back straight if it gets a little sideways. Ideally, you want a lot of restoring moment at high angles, decreasing to near zero at low angles. And if I'm doing all of this work to make this model, I could put some sensors on there and measure that moment. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have a threaded rod coming out of the back of the model, and a few inches behind that, I'll have a load cell. Nothing fancy, just some cheap thing. Then we can set the car up at a few different yaw angles and measure the actual moment. But then I thought, if I'm doing all this design work, maybe we can get some other data as well, like drag and downforce. Aerodynamic instability is bad, but I also don't wanna generate lift. I could easily measure the lift on the front and rear axles with one of those load cells on each axle. And I could also measure drag while I'm at it, and why the hell don't we just add three sensors front and rear to measure every load direction? So I designed a triaxial load cell using three super cheap load cells. I don't actually know if this will work, to be honest. These sensors will pick up loads in the three primary directions, but they also might pick up some loads from moments. We might be able to calculate that out. I don't know, I'm just gonna put this all together and see what happens. These load cells are connected to each other using 3D printed parts. I made these using PPACF. I've talked about this stuff before. It's a high temperature, very high strength nylon. I love this stuff. It's like diet aluminum. The H2D printer has active chamber heating, so it gets up to 60 degrees Celsius before it even starts the print and holds it there throughout the print, so you get a much better layer adhesion than you would on other machines. It also seems to print a little more cleanly on the new machine for reasons I'm not entirely sure of. It might just be the higher chamber temperature. I wired all of these together and about half of them worked. Then I realized the rear sensors were wired backwards, so I fried those. After I replaced those, I wired them all correctly. And yes, I am using prototype boards and the cheapest possible sensors, so it is possible that this just might not be certified good enough. The thing about scale wind tunnel models is that the wind doesn't work the same way at smaller scales. If you scale a car down to one quarter its size, you don't use the same wind speed, and you definitely don't use one quarter of the wind speed. You go the opposite direction. A smaller model needs faster air by a lot. It's not a linear relationship either. It has to do with the Reynolds number. What is the Reynolds number? No, I'm asking you. I still don't understand what this number means. Apparently it measures the ratio between inertial forces and viscous forces in a fluid, whatever that means. All I know is that you want a similar Reynolds number in scale wind tunnel testing so that you have laminar and turbulent flow happening in the same places on the scale model that you do on the real thing. To get a similar Reynolds number to my full scale car going 200 miles per hour, I will need the wind tunnel model to go about five times that fast. 
Obviously, the correct way to do this is to put the model on top of my land speed race car and then get that car to go 1,000 miles per hour. Only then will I have good data from the scale model. Since that sounds difficult, I'm going to aim for highway speeds. Highway speeds partly because we're going to do this on the highway. Wind tunnels are very expensive, but the highway is free. Actually, the interstate highway system is the most expensive construction project in history, but it's free for me, which is the important part. Even at 75 miles per hour, the equivalent speed for the same Reynolds number for the full-scale car is only 16 miles per hour. So we're not getting really good apples-to-apples -apples data here. But I'm going to make a random, slightly educated assumption. Since the car is a relatively simple shape, I'm going to assume that if we see numbers trending in one direction, positive or negative, that those numbers will not flip directions at higher speeds. But you know what they say about assumptions? They save a lot of time. I gave the Aero model a USB butthole so we could access the data from the sensors. We put together the 4x8 plywood test platform, complete with a rounded leading edge and 2x6s to offset it from the roof rack a bit. The test procedure went something like this. We found a stretch of road where we could go 55 miles per hour with minimal traffic and minimal bumps. And we held that speed for 10 seconds while collecting data. The first test we did was using my custom triaxial load cells, and this one had problems. The data we got was pretty much all garbage. Part of this was due to the fact that it was a windy day. We tried to go two different directions to cancel out this effect, but the data was super noisy. Also, the drag load cells are extremely sensitive to board flexing. The model was over-constrained in this direction with two load cells. Just setting the kitchen scale on the board caused a noticeable change in drag load. I pretty quickly decided I wasn't going to get great data from the load cells, and we switched to just sticking the model on the rotating pivot. This is just a wind vane. If the model has aero stability, it will want to point forward as the vehicle drives, and it mostly did. There was something interesting about this test. A few times the model would rotate to about 45 degrees, then it would just stay there, like there was a local maximum of stability at 45 degrees. This did correlate to the tail and the nose of the car just starting to go over the edges of the 4x8 test platform, so I think this probably had more to do with some airflow around the edges of the platform. Probably a high pressure under the front of the platform that spilled up and over the top. Overall, however, the model did seem to want to make its way straight after some time, giving me the sense that the car does have some stability. But we need to get actual numbers to be sure. This is where the rear load cell comes in. I can set the model at different yaw angles and measure the force trying to push the car back straight. Positive numbers are good, and what we really want to see is increasing positive numbers as we increase the yaw angle. Data collection and analysis is a science, and I am not a scientist. I am a somewhat lazy engineer who likes to fix things with a big hammer. Here's the data. Totally clear. Actually, since this is sort of steady state, we can just take an average. Again, not the best data analysis, but good enough for what we're doing. Everything is above zero, which is not great. One of these numbers should be exactly zero, because with the car pointed straight, there shouldn't be any side load. But it's not, probably because we didn't get the platform exactly lined up straight on the roof. But there is a somewhat clear difference between the lines, so if this one is zero degrees, and this is one, and this is two, this is four, and this is six, then we're good. But it's not. It's all jumbled up. So let's try two new ideas. The first is a bigger vertical stabilizer. With this on, we kept the car at six degrees of yaw and did two tests. One at 55 miles per hour and one at a different speed that I'm just going to call faster than 55. And that data looks better. The 55 run had more force trying to straighten up the car than any of the other runs with the smaller stabilizer. And the faster run was even higher. The second thing I tried was moving the pivot forward. This has the same effect as moving the center of mass of the car forward 5 inches. This could be accomplished pretty easily with 80 pounds of lead weights in the nose of the car or also with me just getting really fat. Adding weight to a land speed car is not a big detriment since there is plenty of distance for acceleration. I left the big stabilizer on there when I did two more tests at 55 and that faster speed, and the results were as expected. Showing an even greater restoring moment with a larger stabilizer and center of mass moved forward, and even more so with a faster speed. This is the trend I expected to see with the initial data, but using the roof of your car as a wind tunnel adds a lot of noise and variables to the testing. Apparently there is a reason people spend lots of money on actual wind tunnel testing. Using the model as a wind vane showed that it does make its way pointing forward, which is really the most important part. But I might still try to get a more substantial restoring moment. 
Adding a larger stabilizer will have a very small drag penalty since it is more area for the air to move over, but I kind of want to do that. I won't need to change the lower part with the ham sandwich, so don't worry about that, just the upper part. I kind of want to remake that anyway. I used some cheap PETG filament for that, and it warped so bad that I needed to print a piece on the outside to even it out. With the new H2D printer and some better filament, I can make a much more dimensionally accurate print in fewer pieces, so I might just do that. I also won't need to wrap it in carbon fiber since I can just use a high-strength filament. I do plan on taking this model to an actual wind tunnel in the near future, and I'll go over a lot more detail about wind tunnel testing, and I'll try to see if I can correlate the wind tunnel data to my highway arrow testing, and also the computer analysis I did earlier. So click that subscribe button so you don't miss that. Bamboo supports this channel, and they sent me this printer at no cost, so I'm not going to pretend like I'm some objective reviewer. But if you watch my channel, you know that my X1 has been my most used tool in my garage over the last year, and the new H2D is improved in every way that I wanted it to be. It's bigger, it has a heated chamber, the AMS will dry your filaments and keep them dry, the prints are more consistent and more accurate, even considering the X1 gives very consistent and accurate prints. The laser is super easy to use, I don't imagine it will be as useful as the print printer, but I can think of some things to use it for. I made this switch panel on a friend's laser a while back, as well as foam cutouts for my tools, so I do know there are lots of use cases for a laser. In any case, the printer itself is excellent, a step up from an already great machine. I'm surprised it doesn't cost a few hundred dollars more than it does. If you already have an X1 and you're wondering if it's worth the upgrade, here's my thoughts. I would say if you're doing larger prints, high temperature and high strength filaments, or prints that use two filaments or a lot of support material, then probably. For my kinds of use cases, actual functional prints that need to be strong and accurate, I am super happy with it. It is a serious fabrication tool that you can use to do real engineering, and also fake engineering, and also whatever this is. And if you don't have a printer, and you do stuff like I do, you should get a bamboo. They have one for your budget, and it will change the way you make things. Click the link in the description, check it out, and thanks for watching. Alright, three, two, one.